Christ's name. Amen. You have a seat. Amen. Well, good morning, Terra Nova. My name's Ed Marcel. I serve as the lead pastor here in Troy. Welcome this Lord's Day. We're going to be in the book of Revelation, so if you have a Bible, find your way there. If you don't, simply raise your hand and someone will be glad to bring you a Bible. Uh, we're going to be jumping around in Revelation, so it might be good to have one if you don't have one with you today, just to raise your hand and, and do that. It's, it's the last book of the Bible. Uh, it's also the, the end of a series we've been going through in the people of God that we started under three years ago. I know there were these rumors that it was three and a half. I don't expect everyone to be good at math, but we started in September of 2015, and we're gonna be wrapping that up. But I want us to spend a little bit of time considering, before we even get into Revelation, where we've been in this series, and why it's so important. This series was called The People of God. And what it was meant to do is to tell the story of God through his people as presented in the Bible. The, the Bible is so uniquely presented this way. We, we began this series with creation. And in, in the beginning, in Genesis, we see before anything was, before the visible stuff that we touch, taste, feel, smell, work for, own, and try to store it over, there was God before all the things that we could imagine could be in possibility, there was God. The main character pre-existing everything else. Everything in this world, yourself included, is a consequence to God being the creator, eternal one. And in creation, we saw the power and planning and thoughtfulness of this God who at once makes all things from nothing. By the power only of his word, we see this great power, but he makes them perfectly beautiful. It's the kind of stuff that inspires us still. We who are so jaded and so inundated with pictures in the information age can still look at the beauty of nature and find that the word awe still comes to mind properly. And yet in all the beauty, there's nothing wasted. It's perfect engineering of all things in the world. And in all of our massive scientific mind and discovery of that, it's just chasing after the precision that God created in the beginning. And there he is, over this world, creating it all, all of it pronounced good, and he puts mankind in the garden. The, the final crown of creation are these in the image of their God. Understand, people of God, this is your calling, to be in his image, to walk with him and follow after him. The creature has to be informed by the creator. There was an enemy who entered the garden, and mankind falls. And in that fall, there, there now becomes this, this darkness. The people of God are no longer sharing everything with the people of God. If you remember in Genesis, they begin hiding in the very creation they were meant to share. And the question for the rest of the Bible is, will God and the people of God ever sync up rightly again? We see it for a little while, for moments, then the people of God turn to their idols or, or just forget and grow dull. And it's this constant cycle that just ends up being repeated. And more comes in. The journey now is harder because of that separation. When separated from God, death comes in. And if you look through Genesis, it's like an endless obituary. You, you just keep seeing, and this one was born, this one died, and this one was born, this one died. I don't think those passages are there to bore us, just to read like a phone book, and we're trying to pronounce these Hebrew names, uh, which my advice is just say them quickly and confidently, because very few other people know how they're properly said anyway, and you can get away with that. I think the repetition, repetition and rhythm is there, just like it was good in the beginning. It's telling us death is accompanying you in this journey now. Everywhere, everyone. That death is right around the corner at some point. That endless obituary because of sin, separation from God. And even without death, the world became a much harder place. A whole book of that period, Job, is all about suffering and why people suffer and what we should do about the suffering and how God is involved even in our suffering. And God never left the people without promise. He made a promise to them after the fall that he would restore through one. And then he began to make this promise through people and we enter the period of the patriarchs. God displayed himself as a covenant maker. This is one of those repeated patterns in God's uh, projection of himself, that he will make promises and keep promises. This makes him unique, because every other person will make promises 
and eventually break a whole lot of those promises. Either intentionally, they were just lying up front. By omission, they just forgot about it and didn't do that thing. But breaking promise becomes part of our world and dealing with it. I still can remember my daughter telling me that she learned how faithful God was because she believed that I didn't lie, that I always kept my promises. What, what a wonderful thing for a daughter to believe until one snowy day when she said, Dad, will you come out sledding with me? I said, of course, we'll be out momentarily. She sat on a hill, whatever she was, six years old, snow falling, building little piles on her head and shoulders, waiting and waiting until dark when she realized Dad is not coming out. And it was the first time I had broken a promise to her. And she said immediately, she, she was feeling sad, but immediately the Spirit was speaking in her heart to say, but Bethany, I will never break a promise. So I said, Beth, I can't really apologize because I, I helped you. I sort of helped you see something more about God, so I, th I think we are good. And he makes a covenant to Abraham. And he says in this covenant, I will do it all. I will restore land and seed and blessing, the three key components of that covenant he makes with Abraham are things that undo the loss that we had in that separation from God. It's important that we recognize lies and truth. That's the pattern that's always presented. It was the lie that ruined everything. And the promise of God who cannot lie, the scriptures say, that brings these people into this covenant. The Abraham covenant is gonna be really important. Jesus will bring it up. Paul will base a lot of theology of salvation that he teaches in Romans on this covenant. Because during this covenant, Abraham's part of the deal was to lay there motionless like he was in a coma. And God walked through and did all the work of the covenant. And, and the pattern that's repeated again and again is follow after God. You're not working to create the path. You're not working to create the plan. You're a follower. And Abraham is the one who became that first pilgrim who left everything he had and knew, everything he was comfortable with, everything this world could offer him in security. He leaves because he's following God and this promise of land and seed and blessing. And he's a wanderer without a home. He's a man without a child, and he's constantly in danger. And yet this promise of land and seed and blessing, which seems so absent, drives him on because he's following after God. Eventually he has that son, the seed, the line of promise survives, and he has Isaac, the one named after laughter, because they laughed so hard at what God did that they couldn't expect. The things they could not ask or imagine was not just a phrase for Abraham and Sarah. They understood it, had a name and a face. It was Isaac. Isaac will live a long life, longest of all the patriarchs, and marry his wife, Rebecca, and she will bear him eventually two sons number of years when nothing's happening, no children. And, and this is the promised line. The, the, the fear and anxiety, if you're reading this for the first time, is will the promise not be fulfilled if this guy has no sons? But he has two, Jacob and Esau. Jacob is most famous for stealing the birthright of his brother Esau, who was just a, a guy who liked to live out in the woods and hunt. When Jacob goes to steal this from Isaac to get the blessing that the father would give to his son, he dresses up as his brother. He puts on his old clothes, so he has his brother's B.O. about him. His dad says, oh, you smell like the field, which I think is a nice way of saying, you have not touched deodorant in a long time, Esau. Uh, and then he, put, then he put goat hair on his arms so that dad would touch goat hair and go, oh, it's Esau. I mean. This dude was hairy on a level that not even in all my Italian Irish shirtless nightmares could ever come close to matching if goat on the arm makes you think, that's my boy. And, and he, takes, he, he takes by deceit this promise. He's a guy who's trying to work the promises for himself rather than relying and following on God. This is one of those patterns of the people of God and their faithlessness. We constantly get worried and try in our own way to make things happen, even when it violates God's ways. Excuse me, Jacob, also called Israel, will, will have 12 sons. They will be the titular heads of the tribes of Israel. And the, the one will be particularly special, his name is Joseph. And, and he has this ability to see visions, to dream dreams, to give interpretation, and God speaks through him. And what he says is, Joseph, your brother's gonna bow down to you you will be sort of central among them. And, and they don't take this well, so they throw him into a pit, sell him to slave traders, and he's brought as a slave to Egypt. 
the Bible is filled with a reality in its presentation. It is not a fairy tale. It does not sugarcoat things like myths and stories do. It has the ugliest side of humanity. And it's the people of God who are doing this thing. And they find themselves now in Egypt. The nations in the Bible are often at odds with what God's plan is. They're trying to rule the world themselves. And Egypt is almost symbolic and synonymous with the worst one, at least at this time. And yet Joseph finds he prospers there eventually. And in the midst of a famine, he brings his people in, his brothers too, and provides for them. And says that magical line of, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. That, that even in the gaps of our worst stuff, God is at work. He's not thwarted by our efforts of doing wrong and not following him and how thankful we can be for that. And there's an enduring love that comes from God that stays with the people of God, even in Egypt. But the people grow comfortable there. And here's something as the people of God we see again and again that we have to be careful of. That we can find the blessings of the place we're in become the central thing of our lives. They begin to adopt the culture. They become part of the system and the wealth makes them complacent. They become no longer pilgrims, but those who are just ruling Egypt. Until they realize again that the nations don't love them. This is not their plan. Eventually there's always a divide between the nations and the people of God. And they begin to try to kill these people and they push them out into the Exodus. God delivers them. He does it through a central person. And once again, we see this pattern that God seems to keep appointing one, whether it's Adam or Abraham or now Moses who will be the one who delivers them. Moses will recognize the patterns and say there's going to be another one like me someday. In Deuteronomy 18 15 he says the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you from your brothers. It is him you shall listen to. Who would be like Moses? A prophet who was born into a king's house but gave it up to identify with his people. He left all the royal confines and found himself in a desert to be prepared to serve them and deliver them, who will work for their deliverance and ultimately take all the spoils of the oppressor and heap them as a reward upon the people of God. The picture begins to get there clearer and clearer. It ends up being a lot of what Revelation is all about deliverance from the nations and from evil, the curses that are upon them and the preservation of the people of God who are richly rewarded in the end. But the people of God stopped short of what the Exodus was supposed to bring them, a homeland. And, and at that point, the, the judges are used to deliver the people. It's what that word means. And, and there are a couple of pieces of patterning here too, that when we stop short, whether by fear or inertia or some other desire, we're essentially living out the nature of sin, a rebellion against God. Judges is caught in one phrase. The people of God did what was right in their own eyes. That, that's the nature of sin and rebellion. I'll hang my own shingle. I'll rule my own house. I am my own master. No man or God tells me what to do. I do what's right in my own eyes. We, we throw out objective truth. Deep, deep woe on the men and women of the world who throw out objective truth, who say, we can't know what's true and what's not true. God doesn't exist and cannot declare what's right and wrong. We will end up with such confusion that I think we would get disoriented so quickly that we couldn't tell boys and girls apart anymore, that we couldn't tell evil from good anymore, that men and women would talk about killing their children as though it was a sacred right and a promise and they were doing good by protecting that. So there's deep woe on those in any nation in any time who say only I know what's true and I'll do what was right in my own eyes. Eventually, they're led across the Jordan by the God who keeps delivering them. In the midst of the unfaithfulness of the people of God, God constantly is bringing deliverance. Such an encouraging pattern for us to know because we're daily, weekly, monthly, yearly throughout our lives walking through our own infidelity to God and wondering at times, will he be there? For the people of God, he was always there. They find themselves in the land, and now they have to set up and rule for themselves under God. They end up with kings, it's what they wanted, and the first one ends up being very bad, he's the tall one. Then David, uh, after Saul, is this really good king. And, and the kings end up representing the rule of God. They represent it imperfectly, 
They show God by their own absences. When they do wrong, the people know, well, God didn't rule like that. And when they do right, the people know God is like that. He's like a great king. Worldliness always creeps in. Even in the land, the sinfulness of the people begins to creep in. And God makes promises to this King David in 2 Samuel 7, another big covenant where he says, there's going to be another king. You guys are partial and you're bad copies of what should be. But there will be a king, I promise you, from your line who will rule forever and ever. His kingdom will have no end. So they have this kingship, but it's this temporary kingship that they have. And they have priests. They have the grace of God, not just the rule of God. Men and women end up going to the temple with sacrifices because they know they carry sin. They know they have the separation from God that is the smell of death all over them. And yet they constantly find this mercy and grace that sacrifices made on their behalf, blood spilt on their behalf by the priests, and they're told your sins are forgiven. You'll be cleansed because of the sacrifices that are made. Otherwise, we would lose heart. Kings and priests and prophets, the word of God spoken to them because we are so quick to forget. Most of the prophets in the Bible don't predict what's coming in the future. They're, they're not just a whole series of Nostradamus kind of guys with scrolls. More often than not, what they're doing is reminding the people of God, here's what God said in the past. And we will change our futures if we follow after God, if we repent, if we turn our hearts back to what his word says and follow after that. Prophets, priests, and kings. But the people will lose what God gave them. They'll lose the land because they lose their heart for God even in the midst of all the promises fulfilled and blessings that they were given. God established it for them just like in Genesis and they will lose it just like in Genesis. The, the nations, the other people, the ones who are setting up rules without God will come in and destroy and take these people out into exile. And that was the next chapter in the people of God that we, we saw they were no longer in the land. They had lost what they were given, a community of people blown completely off course. No more kings, no more priests, the temple's gone. But the word of God is still there. And prophets continue to speak for them. In your worst disoriented times in this world of Babylon, where you just don't know what's going on, things are going wrong, you're suffering constantly, listen to the word of God. It is the last anchor that he has for us, even when the people of God are seeing everything destroyed around them. They end up in such a sad state that they have to beg the kings of this world to give them money and supplies to rebuild Jerusalem. Eventually, from exile, they rebuild Jerusalem Unique observation there, they rebuild the temple before they rebuild the city. In the rebuilding of your life, and let's be honest, you and I constantly need our lives in reformation and rebuilt. Build that centerpiece first. Build the temple first. Build the place where you meet God in his grace and truth, and then build the city around that. Don't, don't tell yourself things like, when I get all these other things in order, I'll have time for God. It's a lie for one, and it's an inversion of the way that God has his people rebuild things always. Me first, then the stuff will work out. Sometimes there has to be great patience in that. There are 400 years of silence between the Old and the New Testament. It's about how long the people of God were in slavery in Egypt when there was silence. And then Moses. And remember Moses said, there's going to be one like me, one born royally, one stepping out to serve his people, one who comes after 400 years. And the Gospels present the story of Jesus, the hinge of the whole plan of God. The promises now are getting fulfilled in almost dizzying numbers, hundreds of prophecies from the Old Testament we see now being fulfilled in Jesus that, that God would send an offspring who was born only of woman in Genesis 3.15, that, that he would come from the seed of Abraham and, and rule from the line of David, that his kingdom would have no end, that he would be a prophet like Moses. As Micah said, he'd be born in Bethlehem of Judah. Isaiah would tell us he would be born of a virgin. He would be called Wonderful, Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. And he would ride in Jerusalem on a donkey as promised by Zechariah. He would be pierced for our transgressions and our iniquities, as Isaiah wrote. The chastisement of us fell upon him. He took the wrath of God. He would be buried with the wicked, they would say. 
David would write in the Psalms that he would be resurrected from the grave and that his body would see no corruption even in that death. And Daniel will tell us he would come from heaven again, visibly, the Son of Man. And Zechariah would say when Israel finally sees him on that day, they will weep as though they'd lost an only son. And Jesus is born. He will uniquely claim to be God. No other man or woman on this earth has ever lived up to the claim. Most religious leaders of the world's great religions never made this claim. He's crucified. He also makes a claim about that. That no one took his life, that he laid it down himself in order to undo the curse, to pay for all sins, to be the final sacrifice that all those animals were a picture of. And that he would break the power of Satan the liar and deceiver of sin, what separated us and left us in suffering, and death, that final end of life without God. And he rises as promised, and he sends his disciples into the world, the book of Acts. It's the story of the early church and how they expand from being witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, even to the very ends of the world. They display Jesus as alive because they are a changed people, and they begin to live like Jesus. They, they begin to develop the same enemies of Jesus as they preach in the same city Jesus did. They see conversion and healing like Jesus did. Jesus is alive in the people of God. Death did not separate him. It's a period where the church is being established as visible. There's order, there's new places. It's also a period punctuated with miracles. The Bible has miracles throughout it, but really mostly punctuated in three main places. Here's where most of them occur. With Moses and the Exodus. When the people are leaving Egypt and being reestablished as a people, God showers them with miracles. You don't see them every other day in, in Chronicles and Kings. You see them like constantly when they're in the wilderness. At the time of Elijah and Elisha, where he has sort of this last chance and, uh, of how things are going with a world gone bad, you see a ton of miracles. He's trying to reestablish the people. And the other place in the Bible, here. The vast majority of the Bible's miracles happen in three places. See, here's one of the things that we can do is take things in the Bible and present them to ourselves in a proportion not known by the Bible, and that will always lead to screwy practices in our lives. If we think every day should be like Acts chapter two where tongues of fire fall and people are speaking in other languages and there are great signs and wonders, we're kidding ourselves because the rest of the book of Acts wasn't always like Acts chapter two. And the rest of the epistles aren't like Acts chapter two. Can God do those things? Yep, I believe he still does. But do they happen in the kind of showering of miracles that, that happened with Moses or Elijah or the apostles? Not my experience, not my experience. But that's not the pattern of the Bible anyway. It's these great moments where they keep reminding them, remember this happened now and be faithful to these things. This is what we're built on, the book of Acts. And then the epistles, where the people of God are now receiving letters at these churches. We went through it in brief and got a chance to look at some of the authors. The next series that we're gonna be doing is from these epistles. It'll be 1 Corinthians and, and we'll go to the church at Corinth. We often have such nostalgia about the first century church and how perfect they must have been and how sad and lowly are our churches of the 21st century. I think you're really gonna enjoy this series when you see all the great dysfunction of the church at Corinth and we say, yay, we're like they are. We got the first century thing wrapped up on lockdown. But before we get to 1 Corinthians, we have to deal with the end of the world as we know it and still feel fine. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Diane and I wondered last night, will people like under 30 just stare blankly as people who are over 30 laugh at these lyrics? Th then I was gonna recite all the lyrics by memory. I thought, no, that's just showy. We'll just leave Lenny Bruce in his fearless state alone. So let's wrap up the book of Revelation from where we were. We, we saw John on Patmos, the only apostle who would not die a martyr's terrible, violent death. And he has this vision and the vision is what is to come, and it's these letters to the seven churches, and it explains all the pieces of the future. So let me now jump into Revelation, chapter, I believe I'm in 13, but I didn't write the chapter number here. It's gonna be 13 or 16. Uh, yeah, we're 13. 
Memories of steel trap still, people. <laughs> Revelation chapter 13. Let's read verses 1 through 8. I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. The beast becomes the realization of the last great power. We've known little beasts throughout. The prophet Daniel talked about the whole sequence of world leaders who would come and all that they would do. It's the creation of this world system, the place that we would call Babylon, where the powers of this world without God will always try to create a world in its own image. It will always be ruled by strength, which can quickly be tyrannical and abusive. It will not have a heart of grace or mercy, but of great greed, and it will try to control all people. It was pictured in, in, in Babylon, it was pictured in Persia, it was pictured in Rome, and it'll come again. He, he will split the world with the same temptation that the devil will use for Jesus in Matthew 16. Fall down and worship me. And it says all, all besides those who are the lambs will end up worshiping the beast. Behind him is the real power, he's a puppet, it's Satan still trying to build a world without God. Never love your government and your country to the point of a blinding loyalty that believes they will always provide, protect, and love you. For some of you, that's a non-issue. You caught that one early on. For some of you, it's a tweak that you need to make and get. Babylon does not love the people of God. Babylon eventually rejects the people of God and tries to kill the people of God. We saw the beginnings of it in Egypt, and it's going to come to a, a, a real uh, crescendo in the book of Revelation. And, and there's another beast, a second beast, who comes out. It says in verse 16, or 15, sorry, he works for the first beast. Um, in 16, it says, also he causes both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 666. So he does these uh, amazing signs to deceive, but his main purpose is to consolidate economic power so that the beast can rule over everyone with military power who can make war with them, and he can control everyone through economic power. These are the structure systems of control that ultimately are against God in this world. Oh, the 666 thing. Well, it's not the barcode. We know that, even though the people who designed the barcode started it with a six, always have a six as the middle break, always have a six at the end. It's not the barcode. It's not Ronald Reagan, even though I remember at one point people said, Ronald Wilson Reagan? His name has six letters, his middle name six letters, his last name has six letters. Sweet Moses, he's the Antichrist. Nope. It's not Apple Computer whose developers sold the first Apple I Steve Jobs demanded to be priced at, you got it, $666 with the logo of an Apple bitten that gave wisdom to all. But not the beast. Not the number of the beast. Numerology at the time, most people say it would have pointed to Nero, that the numerology of Latin would have said that's his name. The numerology of Hebrew also ending up in sixes is the beast, and that he was saying, look, this ruler 
The guy who's running the show right now, who has all the military might and economic might, that's what the beast looks like. And if you buy into that, if ultimately your identity, your security, your future, your entire portion is just the strength of this world and the economic systems of this world, you're falling into this. Now, I want to be careful. That doesn't mean go become a hermit and a prepper, stop working your job, get rid of all your cash. If you're thinking that way, I'll put it in a lockbox for you and you can have it back when you come to your senses. But you, you still have to be able to work your jobs and provide for your family and do noble and honorable things in your workplaces to be a light of the kingdom of God, to be an ambassador put in this place. But it's not who we are. It's not our identity. Remember the patterns of the church always got slowed up or went astray when they began to love what the nations had too much for them, when they wanted to be just like the nations. And we can quickly end up being people who suffer from Stockholm Syndrome that psychological disorder of those held hostage for long enough where they begin to sympathize with those who hold them hostage. They become familiar with them. They start to believe their demands are right. We can live in this world so intimately that we can lose sight of God as central. And we begin to want everything that the world advertises. Every last bit of stuff they say, we either want to sell it, buy it, or steal it. Every last measure of success becomes our great anxiety if we don't have that success in our life. The world is sneaky in its power that way and will try to seduce and steal. But the world ends. All of its power comes to nothing in a moment. In Revelation 16, it says, in the midst of the judgment of the bowls, the fifth angel, in verse 10, poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. The fall of Babylon of the beast and all of its power come quickly. It's the end of all the pieces that are set up Chapter 18 in Revelation says this. It's a little bit longer of a passage. I'll get through as quickly as I can. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast, for all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual morality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual morality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. Pictured as a great prostitute in Revelation, she's, she's that world system that holds all the goods that tells us again and again material stuff will make our souls satisfied and happy. And we believe the lie time after time waiting for the next thing to come out. Whose pleasure is so intoxicating it can seduce and numb people away from their own truest passions. They become men and women who forget God. And then gone. All the things chased after, all the things held, all the measurements of, of what was going to make us right, gone in one hour. And a disoriented world hates God for stealing what they thought was their meaning. The world weeps over missing Babylon. And yet Babylon is what has enslaved them the whole time. Now there's nothing left to cling to. No panic rooms are going to protect them. No gold reserve means anything. They're like the people of Pompeii and Herculeum, who in, in 79 AD when Vesuvius erupted, 
they were just caught there. In a moment, it was all gone, dead. And, and people became encased in the molten lava and ash that was there, and they became instant and enduring statues of those moments. There's one particular cutting one. This guy has a sword, and he's standing protecting his pile of treasure as a couple other guys are trying to get it in those last minutes. Just, boy, they're just, they're trying to get a couple dollars before everything is destroyed. And I can't help thinking, people of God, those eerie and case figures have a sermon for us. That someday we will look very carefully at how we lived with Babylon while we were here. And I fear some of us are going to be ashamed of the moments that could be caught in freeze frame of how we loved this place. Don't fall into its trap. Work hard, earn your keep, do the things that honor God, but don't hold this with both hands. The earth mourns it, but heaven has a very different picture in, in, in the last battle that it has. Uh, the nations mourned in Revelation 16. But the next chapter will say that I saw heaven to open. Behold, a white horse the one sitting on it called Faithful and True. In righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. The final battle, Jesus will show up. He's got all the army of the saints behind him, but it's over with a word. There isn't a need for battle. That's, I think, why everyone wears white linen, because white linen is not a good war choice, right? It's you're going to kind of stand out. It's not exactly camouflage. And war can get you dirty from what I've seen in pictures anyway. Uh, blood, mud, and guts. And nope, they're wearing white linen on white horses. But there's already blood because the battle's already been had. Jesus' robe dipped in blood. It, it was won already. And Jesus is just displaying that now in his return. Just like the people of God could not work for their salvation. This is the fruition of that. They cannot build it on their own. And the last battle is over. And then the last point of the day, the end will come. Heaven and hell and the eternal state. The place where we will spend our endless days as the people we were always meant to be with the God we have loved at arm's length and distance is spoken of very little in the Bible. In some ways we're pilgrims like Abraham. We're slowly leaving everything we know and all the stuff we've held and all the things that would make us safe to go to a place that we don't really know. But we're following God. He said, I, I go to prepare a place for you. If it wasn't true, I wouldn't have told you that. But I prepare this place so that where I am, you may also be. The whole story is that separation between the people of God and God. And Jesus says, I have a place. I have a solution where we will be together. This section of Revelation reveals the pieces of the eternal state at the end. Heaven. What's it like? The afterlife isn't talked about much. In the Old Testament, you can really find about two places. And that's why a, a lot of Jewish groups will say there, there isn't really an afterlife. This is it, because it's so sparse in there. One is in the book of Job, where Job, the wealthy, righteous guy, has great suffering come upon him. He loses all his money. He loses his personal health. He loses his children. Satan strategically leaves his wife, who tells him to curse God and die. Right? He's lost everything. And then at the end, God restores everything. Gives him twice as much money, twice as much cattle, and the same amount of children. Double everything else except the children. Why? The implication is they weren't destroyed. They just got a change of address when they died. Their life continues. So God doubles everything, but not the human beings. David, when his child with Bathsheba dies, says, I'll go to him. He won't come to me again, but I will go to him. St. Paul will tell us that eye hasn't seen and ear hasn't heard what God has prepared for us. But the implication is that it's glorious. And preceding all of that is this judgment that will divide, like Jesus talked about with sheep and goats, wheat and chaff. It's the end one, where there is no other option at that point. 
Revelation 20, verse 7. When the thousand years had ended, because Jesus had put evil away for a thousand years of reign on the earth, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their numbers like the sand of the sea. They marched up over a broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city, but fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown in the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown in the lake of fire. It's the culmination of a lot, right? It's the, the moment in the valley of Megiddo, Armageddon, where the last battle happens. By the way, when Napoleon saw this battlefield, he said this would be the perfect place for the greatest battle that I could imagine. And it's this amphitheater of a valley, and all the nations are there, and with a moment they're consumed, and then judgment. Two books, sets of books. One is of life. And if you're in the Lamb's book of life, you're not judged by your deeds. But if you haven't taken that work, if you don't take the blood Jesus spilled for you, you're judged by what you have done. And everyone who gets that judgment is thrown into the lake of fire with Satan and the beast. A lot of argument over literal lake of fire, figure of lake of fire, I can never figure out why such an argument. If it's a literal lake of fire, it burns and you're miserable. If it's a metaphorical lake of fire, it's like burning and you're miserable. So it, it, it doesn't really get that much play for me to keep working through that one and getting arguments with people over that. What we know, it says their suffering and torment never ends, day and night. They get what they finally wanted, a world of their own without God. And the end of that world is not full of beauty and truth and life. It's full of death and darkness and division. The place that we know as hell is the place of absence of God because they have the breath of God in them. It goes on forever and ever in this empty world without God as they continue to curse him and not repent, earning eternally their next day of judgment and suffering. And then the end of it all, the eternal state, the place that we call heaven. Revelation 21, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, Death shall be no more, neither shall it be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Everyone's together in this city. And it's a city the likes of which we have never known. A city without death, a city without tears, a city without crime, a city without tensions, a city without the worst of us living all over the city. It's also a city without a temple. Jerusalem doesn't have one of those because there's, there's no more need to go to that place to try to find intimacy with God. The very air itself, the presence of the God is everywhere. The hearts of people and men and women changed because the presence of God is everywhere. It's hard to imagine, but you probably, if you follow God, have moments where you could say, this was a profound moment when I knew God was aware of my life and I was aware of his presence and he was there. That's probably a really dim picture of the presence of God that can be in your life. And to have that thing amped up full and never changing is what the eternal state is. There's also a wrap up of an ending because Revelation isn't just the end of Revelation, it's the end of the Bible. And it pulls all things back together. The tree of life too. It says, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, 
but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent this angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. The journey's long. Evil's present in this world. Suffering is acutely real in this world. But God is patient and living and on the throne. And the plan does resolve. Jesus has overcome. He is your priest who died for you. He is your prophet who still speaks the word of God to you while you're in exile. And he's your king waiting to be revealed at this end time. The book closes with words I want to close with as the band comes up. John writes, Hugh testifies to these things, says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, We who are in exile know we are not lost. We are ambassadors, not refugees anymore if we know Jesus. God, we trust that your presence overcomes the evil of this world and even the evil within us. Lord, that book of so much suffering and terror, it it provokes the thought of how could John say and how can we say it, bring this, only because we know that with that judgment will bring the plan of God to its fruition. And Lord, that's what we want. We don't want to play in a sandbox of our own making anymore. We we want what you have. We want your presence. We want to be followers. Father, it's my prayer that the men and women of Terra Nova Church would see themselves as the people of God and we would walk humbly as your ambassadors through this world, that much would be made of Jesus in our hearts and in the minds and hearts of others. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Oh, Amen. We're going to transition now to this time of.